This week on Vaticano, Pope Francis approves the canonization causes for seven new saints. Learn with us about the history of the Pope's personal security corps, the Pontifical Swiss Guard, and meet Sister Victoria Kovalchuk, who helps refugees in Greece by making rag dolls. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Pope Francis has approved the canonization causes for seven new saints. Cardinal Marcello Semeraro, prefect of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, presented the causes in an ordinary public consistory on May the 3rd. Among the new saints to be are the Frenchmen, Blessed Charles de Foucault, martyred for the faith in 1916 in Algeria, and Blessed Lazarus, a convert from Hinduism, who will be the first Indian layman to be canonized. The date of the canonization has not yet been set due to the ongoing COVID situation. Two months after his historic trip to the land of Abraham, Pope Francis met with Iraq's Minister for Foreign Affairs, Fuad Mohammed Hussein, on May the 3rd. The Holy Father presented Mr. Hussein with an olive branch, symbolizing their shared desire for peace in the Middle East, as well as a copy of his recent encyclical, Fratelli Tutti. The Holy Father met with the President of the Swiss Confederation, His Excellency Mr. Guy Parmelin, to discuss the historic relationship between the Vatican and Switzerland. Both Pope Francis and President Parmelin reinforced their commitment to strengthening the friendship between the two countries, and the two exchanged gifts to symbolize their mutual respect and understanding. The Holy Father and the President also spoke about the dutiful and fruitful service of the Swiss Guard on the morning of the swearing-in ceremony of 34 new recruits. For the second consecutive year, the swearing-in ceremony for the Pontifical Swiss Guard took place with a restricted number of people. Due to COVID regulations, the 34 new recruits were sworn into service with only their close family members present. Nel nome del Padre e del Figlio e dello Spirito Santo. Amen. The day started with Holy Mass at the altar of the chair in St. Peter's Basilica, where the Vatican Secretary of State, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, encouraged the men to remain in Christ. The limited number of people couldn't spoil the richness of the ceremony. Rather, it made it more intimate and family-like. At just 20 years old, John Andrea Bossi reflected on this milestone a few moments before being sworn in. It's a great honor for me, for all of us. We woke up early in the morning, but all with motivation. We we, are really, we prepared for weeks or months for this day and yeah, it's finally arrived and we are all happy. His parents, Alexandra and Boris, are very proud of their son. They said they will miss him but support his decision to be dedicated to the service and defense of the Pope. I think that was a dream and that dream come, becomes true today. In the, in the end it's to serve God, to serve the Church and to protect the faith and the Pope. With final rehearsals complete, the newly commissioned Swiss guards processed into San Damaso courtyard to the beat of drums and the sound of flutes to swear eternal allegiance to Pope Francis and his successors. Each new recruit approached the Swiss Guard flag as his name was called. Holding the banner in their left hand, new guards raise their right hand and hold up three fingers as a sign of faith in the Holy Trinity. The oath, taken in German, French, Italian or Ladino, depending on the choice of the guard, is, I swear to diligently and faithfully abide by all that has just been read out to me. So help me God and his saints.
Now the smallest army in the world has grown to 130 men who are ready to defend the Vatican and the Pope, even by sacrificing their own lives if necessary. After the break, we learn why May the 6th, the day of the swearing-in ceremony, is so important for Swiss Guards. Fiercely and faithfully. This is the motto of the smallest and most famous army in the world, the Pontifical Swiss Guard. An armed corps born more than 500 years ago, it was on the 22nd of January, 1506, when the warrior Pope Julius II decided to surround himself with soldiers to defend himself against the attacks of his adversaries. To do so, he chose 150 men from Switzerland because they were considered to be brave warriors and loyal to the Pope. Even today, Swiss guards are chosen according to certain characteristics. They must be no less than 174 centimeters tall, that's five feet, eight and a half inches be Catholic and have a good reputation, being a Swiss citizen. As recruits, be under 30 years of age and have completed some military service in Switzerland. Be unmarried, if non-officers. The most tragic and at the same time most heroic event that the Swiss Guards have faced was the attack of the 6th of May, 1527. When Charles V's Spanish troops and the Lansquenets sacked the Vatican. In this dramatic event, known as the Sack of Rome, only 42 of the 189 Swiss Guards managed to save Pope Clement VII. They helped the Pope escape through the so-called Passetto, a secret passageway that runs along the Vatican walls and leads from St. Peter's Basilica to Castel Sant'Angelo. To this day, the Swiss guards still have the key to that hidden escape route. This is the reason why every year on the anniversary of the sack of Rome, the new recruits take their solemn oath in the Cortile di San Damaso, the St. Damasus courtyard in the Vatican. The Swiss guards are essentially the Pope's bodyguards and ensure the security of his residence. The most striking thing in the eyes of visitors is undoubtedly their distinctive uniform, consisting of no fewer than 154 separate pieces. Born in the first half of the 20th century, the uniforms of the Swiss Guards tell the story of their birth. In fact, the ochre and blue colors of the Della Rovere family and the red of the Medici represent the lineages of the popes who welcomed this very special army, which in the course of history has also earned the nickname Defenders of the Freedom of the Church. Mm -hmm. 
On May the 5th, ahead of the swearing-in ceremony, the new Swiss guards and their families prayed vespers at the Church of Santa Maria della Pietà in the Vatican's Teutonic College, and they placed a wreath there in commemoration of the guards who died during the sack of Rome in 1527. EWTN Rome senior contributor Paul Bade brings us inside the church for a glimpse into the dramatic story of the courage of Captain Kaspar Reucht, the Protestant who gave his life to defend the Pope. In 1517, the Reformation broke out in Wittenberg, Germany. In 1521, there was the Reichstag of Worms. That's when the church broke apart. In 1506, in very troubled times, Pope Julius II had ordered the best troops from all over Europe to Rome to be palace guards for him. They were Swiss mercenaries. That was in 1506. Their second commander was called Marcus Reust. He was the mayor of Zurich. Because he himself was too old to serve in the army, he sent his son. His name was Kaspar Reust. Paul Bade follows the path the Spanish troops took when they broke through on May the 6th, 1527, from the Porta dei Cavalleggeri and advanced to the square of the first Roman martyrs. There, 147 Swiss guards stopped the advancing army, and another 42 guards brought the Pope to safety at Castel Sant'Angelo. A few days before, the city council of Zurich had ordered their commander Reust to leave the Vatican and the Pope and to return to Switzerland with the entire Swiss Guard for the city of Zurich, which had just become Protestant itself under Ulrich Zingli. To this, Captain Reust replied to the city council, No, I am indeed now also a Protestant. We are all Zurichers, but we have sworn allegiance to the Pope and cannot now leave him alone. I could not do otherwise before my honor. We will stay. These 147 guardsmen were then massacred by the mercenary forces in front of the obelisk, which at the time still stood to the left of St. Peter's Basilica in the square of the first martyrs of Rome, the same obelisk that St. Peter witnessed before his crucifixion. The chapel of the Swiss guards inside the Santa Maria della Pietà church is undergoing restoration. These frescoes are the only visual documentation of the sacrifice of the 147 Swiss guards and their captain, Kaspar Reust, the captain who remained under the cross of Jesus. This courageous example of the Protestant captain reminds us of Pope Francis' words on the type of ecumenism that Christians live out despite their differences, the ecumenism of blood. And the same can be said of May 6, 1527, when this Protestant Caspar Royst, with his comrades from the Swiss Guard, fell as Protestants for the Catholic Pope. Basically, they are martyrs, even if they are not recognized as such. They have never been asked to become martyrs, but they fell for fidelity to their oath and for the Catholic, Pope Clement VII. And 
that's why the new Swiss Guard recruits are always sworn in on May the 6th. They commemorate the profound witness of the 147 guards, together with Captain Reuscht, a Protestant who gave his life for the Pope. In preparation for the 107th World Day of Migrants and Refugees, Pope Francis issued a message titled Towards an Ever Wider We. In this message, the Pope reflects on the Catholicity of the Church. He writes that we should rely on the Holy Spirit, who enables us to be united in our differences without imposing a depersonalized uniformity. According to the United Nations Refugee Agency, there are at least 80 million forcibly displaced people worldwide. 40% of them are children. On top of the everyday hardships of refugee life, the COVID pandemic has caused additional difficulties. Pope Francis underscored that the coronavirus crisis highlighted some deep divisions between human beings. The Jesuit Refugee Service, or JRS, is one of the Catholic organizations that for 40 years has been on the front lines helping refugees. Second thing is we do some informal education. JRS's international director, Father Tom Smolich, shares with us that the pandemic challenged the organization to look for new ways of working with refugees. What I'm particularly grateful for is the amazing faithfulness of our staff, uh, both international staff, staff locally, especially refugees who work with us. They all found ways to, re to remain present. We switched our classes to radio. We were doing lessons on WhatsApp with individual visits following up on that. Father Smolich shares that in Greece, the situation is particularly complicated because Greece is a gateway to Europe, where refugees tend to arrive to apply for refugee status in the European Union. In terms of JRS, we are active in Athens. Uh, we've been there for many years now. Our primary focus is two. One is, in a sense, particularly working with women and children. Second thing is we do some informal education work. And third, and perhaps the most important thing, is I think it's a ministry of presence. We are blessed to have the Missionary Sisters of the Holy Spirit there. We have some Jesuits and volunteers who realize that in this situation, one of the most important things is to become present. Victoria Square is a big square in the middle of Athens. It's, as you may know, it's kind of, some call it Afghanistan Square now, or Afghani Square, because so many refugees are sort of waiting there, kind of waiting to move on. Okay, make a line, yeah? Line, 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 line. That's our home too. We have a building, we have a center but we're also present there where, where the people are, where the children are, trying to be a connection of hope in what can be a very difficult situation. JRS's mission and the Holy Father's message serve as a call to action to embrace the foreigner and migrant because all people share being made in God's image and likeness. Victoria Square to our so-called Afghani Park. Every day, Sister Victoria Kovalchuk comes to this square to meet her friends. Hello. They call her teacher. E. e F. And she comes here to give the children lessons in the open air. And she's much loved as she always comes with treats and special gifts. Orange. Like these traditional Ukrainian rag dolls that Sister Victoria crafts herself out of secondhand clothing donated to the Jesuit Refugee Service mission in Athens, Greece. 
can write your name here. What is your name? Fa. Fa? Fatma? Yes. This is the way how I do these dolls for my little friends. Actually, we don't need too much materials. Just it's enough a piece of cloth, anything. For the basic, this will, will be our body. I will just roll it as the towel. So at the end, we're going to get our doll. And now it's already time to, to dress it up. The most interesting process is to do with them before the coronavirus when we could gather in the park or just somewhere in the square we could sit together and could do the dolls. I think, I don't know, maybe already 500 dolls are walking around the Greece. Sister Victoria, originally from Crimea, together with her community, the Missionary Sister Servants of the Holy Spirit and Jesuit Refugee Service Volunteers, assist those in need from the heart of Christ the Savior Parish. Besides the street mission, they also run a free clothing shop, language school, and support centers for women. Since 2015, over one million refugees have arrived in Greece, coming from Afghanistan, Syria, Iran, and various African countries. Some have left, but many have stayed and made this place their home. Jesuit father Marcin Bara has been working with the local community, which he says consists mostly of migrants. The difficulty is, is yeah, this integration, yeah, because, because if you have so many nationalities, as I mentioned, in this parish I, I didn't actually, it's, it can be interesting because uh, we have we have only one Greek Greek mass in, in, in our parish, but actually for, for this Greek mass, the majority of people who attend the Greek mass are not Greek. Serving migrants is the primary apostolate of the Catholic Church in Athens. Hello. Sister Victoria says that while she has no power to make drastic changes in their lives, she can offer them her time and her care. And one for you. I tell them, I came here to be with you in your situation. When you cry, I will be with you. When you laugh, I will be with you. I can show you a little bit of love, what I have. I cannot change your situation. I mean, it's, I'm not competent for this. Jesus is the one who brought me here, who puts this love uh, inside me and uh, lets me to leave my family and my country also in difficult situation, but just to go here, and they appreciate it. I think, I, I, I hope, and also I, I feel it like this. Yeah. So it's quite mutual. Now again red. I do here this part. Yes, yeah, beautiful. What is your name? Amir, we write Amir here, yes? A. And for me, you know, I, I don't M. put the name refugee or migrants. These are my friends and uh, these are the people, the people of God, of my God who created them, who love them. And of course, I would, I would like them to know him. And through this friendship, she's rediscovered God himself who has strengthened her vocation. These kids, they are just satisfied and then they will hug me and then they will kiss me. And this is the best what I can get as a reward, these signs of love as a response. Sister Victoria is not looking to be rewarded for her service to those in need. She does it humbly and quietly, out of love for Jesus, who once called her from Crimea.